I'd just like to welcome Samir into our midst. Since everybody has come here to listen to him, he obviously needs no introduction. I just want to say one thing, that of all the third world intellectuals, there is nobody else I know whose commitment, whose dedication and whose insight in the struggle against imperialism is as great as that of Samir Amin. I would like to welcome him to our midst and request him to give his speech. Thank you, Prabhat, uh, uh, for saying more than uh, I deserve, in fact. Um, <clears throat> we are many of that type. But uh, first, let me uh, thank the organizer, Click. Uh, <laughs> News, News Click, <laughs> yeah. um, with uh, which I had just uh, uh, an interview on uh, what is going on in the Arab world. Uh, now, uh, and thanks to all of you, comrades and friends. Now, I think that we cannot speak of 21st century uh, socialism without uh, speaking of 21st century capitalism. Uh, and therefore, I will start with that. That is, uh, what are the major, uh, important, fundamental changes in the capitalist system? And I cannot dissociate capitalism from imperialism. Uh, <clears throat> and I think we should not dissociate at any point in time uh, in order to analyze what are the weaknesses, the contradictions of that system, uh, and therefore to, after that, looking in, to look into what is the strategy, not the conspiracy, but the strategy of the major reactionary forces which uh, defend, uh, represent that, uh, the interest of that capital at that point in time. Uh, that would be the prerequisite for uh, being able to identify uh, what uh, counter strategy of what alternative strategies we should try to develop with a view of uh, opening the moving ahead on the long road to global socialism, and I would say global communism, uh, <clears throat> from global capitalism and imperialism to global communism. Um, now, without giving a recipe, a blueprint of what is that global communism, uh, but starting therefore from the beginning, what is current, what is contemporary capitalist imperialist system? Now, I submit that it's not enough to qualify it as monopoly capital. It's monopoly capital since the end of the 19th century. And this monopoly capital has itself moved through uh, stages. It's not enough to say that this uh, capitalism of today has moved into a deep crisis, not starting with the financial breakdown of 2008, but starting uh, in the 70s of last century, and which, uh, to which uh, capital reacted. Now, <clears throat> I have written elsewhere, compare the long uh, the long uh, crisis, the first long crisis of capitalism, of modern capitalism, uh, starting in the 80s of 19th century and ending with the end of the Second World War, uh, and compared it with the first stages of the second long crisis of capitalism, because I think there is a parallel, a very uh, important parallel to do, but that's not the point I want to raise. Now, capital. Uh, monopoly capital answered, responded to that crisis at the beginning from the mid 70s of last century when the rates of growth fell suddenly and never recovered to half of what they had been during the previous 30 years after World War II. Uh, monopoly capital reacted to that, responded to that challenge uh, of a big crisis starting uh, by uh, one set of of, 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 uh, of measures, which was a higher degree of centralization of the control. And I'm saying the control, not the property of capital. And that uh, included or led to also reshaping 
the pattern of globalization into what is called in commonly globalization today, that is the present pattern of globalization as compared to previous patterns of globalization. And that led to the financialization of the system, and that led to <laughs> the deepening of the crisis, and not and not uh, 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 and not uh, correcting the uh, and not ending uh, the crisis. Now, I submit that in a very short period between 75 and 90, that is 15 years, there has been an accelerated and tremendous. A move up in the centralization of the uh, control of capital. And that is a qualitative change. It's not just a little more centralization of capital as compared to the previous periods of monopoly capital. It is a qualitative change. And if it is a qualitative change, it has to be given a name. I have given it a very banal, vulgar name, generalized monopoly capital. Call it as you want. That's not important. What is the difference between this, at that stage of centralization of capital and the previous stages? Is that we have reached a point where through that centralized control of capital, monopoly capital is controlling everything. That is, is controlling directly or indirectly all types of production all throughout the world. There are no more segments of uh, economic life which are relatively autonomous from monopoly capital, as they were, as they have been for 150 years before. Uh, and that's a qualitative change. Uh, by controlling up, up, uh, upstream and downstream, for instance, agriculture is controlled upstream, and agriculture everywhere in India, as well as in Europe, as well as in the United States, upstream by those who provide credit, uh, uh, inputs, uh, seeds, and so on, downstream by those who control monopoly, who control the, um, the um, commercialization and so on. And that degree, that high level of centralization of capital led to one gigantic change, which is the capacity of this monopoly capital to pump out of the surplus value produced by labor all over the world to the benefit of a growing and fast-growing monopoly rent, which as the global, at the global level is an imperialist monopoly rent. Imperialist and monopoly rent cannot be dissociated. Now, that is the uh, reason for uh, the growing inequality. And simultaneously, and simultaneously the uh, <coughs> breaking down the uh, low levels or, uh, uh, of growth. Huh? In the centers, in the centers. Uh, I'm, I, I will come to the emerging countries later. Now, that is a qualitative change. I submit that it should be central to our understanding of the present crisis. There are description of the present crisis. It's multiple facets. It's ecological facet. It's labor relation facet. It's uh, uh, all kinds and sorts, all the facets of the problem. OK. But that's not enough, because all those facets of uh, the crisis are related directly, I submit, to that centralization. And that is a qualitative change. I insist upon on this point because I feel a little lonely on, on this point, in spite of the fact that all the studies that I have seen, which are analytical of what has happened at the level of centralization of capital, uh, do provide, do sub support my uh, assumption, which becomes a thesis, huh? which becomes a, a major point. Now, we start from there. That change, qualitative change, uh, which, as I said, involved, implied, implied a, a reshaping the globalization that was achieved through the so-called structural adjustment plans, and the uh, move from uh, national, the national popular policies of development, uh, as we have seen in the previous period, in the 30 or 40 years, uh, 30 years, say, of the Bandung non-alignment period, into uh, submitting, accepting the recipe of the so-called neoliberal privatization, dismantling of, of, uh, of the uh, public services, etc., etc. And that led 
uh, led to uh, a pattern, and I would use the word of my uh, late old friend, uh, uh, André Gunderfranc, lumpen development. Not the lumpen development that he analyzed correctly uh, with respect to another continent, Latin America, and in other period of history, but a lumpen development of uh, uh, corresponding to the needs of the reproduction of that, uh, at that level of centralization of capital. This is a very important point because otherwise we, uh, we attribute the present pattern of globalization to our own weaknesses. I mean the failure of really existing socialism, the failure of national popular <laughs> development and so on, which are part of course of, of the picture but which are, um, which are not really at the roots of the qualitative change. Now, that qualitative change led to gigantic political consequences, which uh, I, I shall, uh, <coughs> uh, of which I, I, I shall speak now. First consequence, it led, it created the objective basis for a new pattern of imperialism. That is the collective imperialism of the triad, US, Europe, and Japan, to simplify. Uh, that was not the pattern of imperialism throughout the previous ages of capitalism, which was to be conjugated in, in the plural, imperialist powers in permanent, not only competition, but even war among themselves. Uh, and it being replaced by a collective imperialism. Uh, it, we, it means that at, because at that level of centralization of capital, there is a clear consciousness of that dominant monopoly cent generalized, which I call generalized monopoly capital, call it as you want, generalized monopoly capital, to manage together the world. And I, I'll, I'll come to what it means managing the world according to their own needs for the reproduction of that system. That is a gigantic change, because uh, it doesn't mean, I have no time to go into that, it's one, not my subject, into the eventual secondary contradictions between a number of countries in Europe, not Europe, as, and the United States, perhaps, etc., etc. But it means that there is this clear conception, and it is reflected in the alignment of NATO countries be behind not the hegemonic power, but the leader, uh, because of military means uh, of that leader, the United States, and we can see it daily. And it leads also to the alignment of the comprador bourgeoisies and comprador states, which are the majority in the South presently, on that pattern of globalization and that pattern of management of the global system. Now, that is one major consequence. The other, no less major consequence at the political level, it has changed, and I'll come to the social level, that is the organization of classes, uh, with, with, with a stress perhaps, or, or a focus on uh, the changes in our societies of the South, uh, taking into account, uh, at least uh, <coughs> recognizing the diversity of cases, but still, um, it has led to a, a, a terrific, uh, dramatic change in political life. That is, until that, until that point in time, let's say left and right, as, uh, as historically existing left and right, whether in the North, the uh, bourgeois conservative uh, reactionary eventually, and the middle class, working class, uh, progressive to various degrees, social democracy had a, a, a meaning. And simulta similarly, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, <clears throat> the conflict between right and left in our countries, which means the old comprador uh, allied with all the, our old language, the feudals and I don't know what, eh, on the one hand, and the progressive uh, national bourgeoisie, popular support, and eventually the radical left among them, uh, the uh, communists and so on, had also a meaning. Now, that meaning is lost, is lost. Because at that centralization level of centralization of capital, the political personnel, if we 
call it so, are employees, are employees of abstract capital. We have moved from, we have moved to a level where, where, where capital is abstract capital. Uh, uh, the uh, capitalism which was Im embodied in capitalists, which were names, usually men, families, uh, rooted somewhere with all owners of a factory here and there, has disappeared. It is the property of you don't know whom, it is controlled by you don't know whom, and all these are employees. And that reflects also, we have a political personnel, whether with a label left or right, who are employees, employees, and a fortiori with respect to the media. Huh? Um, perhaps not, um, not um, uh, click, what is it? Uh, news. A news click, <laughs> uh, but uh, unfortunately it's a minor, minor uh, <laughs> means for the media as compared to the others. So, uh, and that is a gigantic change and a gigantic challenge for uh, the radical left, uh, for our tradition of communist left. Uh, because we are dealing with another pattern of society, with another pattern of, uh, of management of power. Now, what is the strategy of that uh, uh, generalized monopoly capital to manage that world? And there I'll come to the, uh, to the uh, uh, emerging countries on one hand, perhaps the countries that we should call the sinking countries, on the other hand, the destroyed countries, and I belong to countries which are a target for destruction by imperialism today, the Middle East countries, um, and, and the others, but also, uh, not only the distinction among them, what is also common, because this is very important, very important, if we have in mind that there will be no step ahead towards socialism if there is not some common coming together. I don't mean repeating uh, Bandung. Uh, there are no, never remake in history. Remakes are, are, good, are bad films, usually. Uh, <coughs> and you know that Mumbai is producing a lot of remakes. Huh? <laughs> uh, but uh, but, uh, but uh, something uh, of that kind. Uh, now, uh, on that ground, uh, the, what we have had, on the one hand, we have the so-called emerging countries. Who are they? They are the countries which, during the previous wave, the first loan crisis, and as part of the answer to the first loan crisis. What was the answer to the first loan crisis? It was not uh, recipe produced by, uh, by, uh, by Keynes uh, or somebody else. No. The answer to the first long crisis was a number of insignificant events, such as World War I, the Russian Revolution, the breakdown of 29, Nazism, Imperial Japan, the Second World War, the Chinese Revolution and the Vietnamese Revolution, the uh, National Independence Movement of, of Asia and Africa. These were the insignificant uh, uh, events which changed the world and which were the response to the first loan crisis. So we are exactly at a point where we are challenged by, uh, we are moving into such a period. Call it as you want, wars and revolutions. War is already on the agenda. Revolution, not yet. Uh, <laughs> but some kinds of uprisings and so on. Uh, now, that is uh, the, what is facing, uh, that uh, challenge the strategy of now the emerging countries therefore were those which at the previous what was the previous wave the first wave of among these insignificant events you have the Russian Revolution in a periphery the Chinese Revolution in a periphery the Vietnamese and later the Cuban in peripheries the movement of national independence which changed the world more than than anything else. Uh, which was in the peripheries, uh, social democracy in the West. Um, uh, these uh, these um, uh, changes, um, uh, this response to, 
to, to the crisis. Um, uh, um, I'm losing the... <laughs> uh, <coughs> this response to the crisis uh, uh, created the conditions for the emerging countries of today. It is not by pure chance that the most su successful, and perhaps in my view, the only successful emerging country is China, is the one which has gone through the most advanced uh, radical revolution among the peripheries as compared to the limited, uh, limited uh, in its radicality movement of national liberation in the rest of Asia and Africa. Uh, <clears throat> In the sense that, due to their success, success, the uh, the uh, this first wave of uh, of building the basis, the objective basis through the revolution, radicalization, and so on, the objective basis through the relative delinking and a relatively auto-centered development created the conditions for being able, uh, compelling during a period of 30 years, maybe. <coughs> Imperialists to adjust, the opposite of structural adjustment, where we are requested to adjust to the uh, demands of uh, the reproduction of generalized monopoly capital control over the world. During that period, it was the reverse. They adjusted, but they adjusted successfully in the sense that the, sh the, the center of gravity of the means of controlling moved from having the monopoly of, of, of industry centers and peripheries were uh, almost synonymous of industrialized versus non-industrialized or de-industrialized countries of the South to the control of the five, what I'm calling the five monopolies or calling the five advantages, the control of technologies, the, co the ex exclusive ac access to the natural resources of the, uh, of the world, the building of an integrated monetary and financial system controlled by them, the uh, media controlled by them, and finally the armament of massive destruction. If you are naughty, we can bomb you. It will be called humanitarian bombing, of course. Huh? <laughs> so <coughs> uh, these are the ways and means by which, uh, uh, um, um, on the one hand, you had the emerging countries, number one, China, number two or two, or two and a half, one and a half, I don't know, uh, uh, and one third, India, Brazil, and others, uh, that is <clears throat> uh, facing, uh, 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 having that capacity for a short period to uh, achieve high rates of, of growth by capitalist means, but different capitalist means, I would call them state capitalism in the case of China, even if there are so-called private owners of capital, and, uh, 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 and, uh, and in, the, in, the, in the frame of the uh, globalized integrated market. Now, but for a short period. Now, uh, those countries are facing, and China is facing successfully, that is having a strategy which, uh, uh, which reduces and perhaps will annihilate those advantages of uh, global capitalism, of global imperialism, on the field of technologies, which they are not only absorbing, but uh, uh, developing a capacity by themselves, on the access to natural resources, and I'll come to that point because it's the main, the main area of conflict, uh, uh, on uh, while well, the monetary and financial integrated system is breaking down and will break down more and more by by its own internal contradiction, and uh, of course armament. Unfortunately, at the level of uh, media, we are zeros, uh, or close to zero uh, globally, and in the South in particular. Uh, now, uh, these are the emerging countries. But uh, now the, uh, the, the battle, ma major battlefront is that this system, in order to reproduce the exclusive continuation of the domination of that a collective imperialism of the triad. Not the triad plus those co-opted in the G20. This is a masquerade. They are not co-opted. It's a tactic to, uh, and you uh, just look at what comes out of the G20, it's close to zero, 
to understand that this is a, a masquerade. Uh, uh, but uh, he, 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 in order to uh, reproduce itself, this system has to, has to, and cannot do any otherwise, uh, ensure the exclusive access to the natural resources of the whole planet in order to reproduce its society as it is, with all the waste and the ecological consequences that we know, etc., etc. I do not deny this dimension at all, but I don't think that it comes by itself because of the scarcity of natural resources and because of the misuse and perhaps even misunderstanding, philosophical misunderstanding of the relation between, between humankind and nature and so on. This comes as a result, necessary result, of the logic of the reproduction of that generalized monopoly capital and not as a, uh, a, 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 a reason by itself, a force operating by itself. Now, so we have uh, the, 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 the target is that exclusive uh, uh, control. How to ensure that exclusive control of the access to the natural resources, therefore depriving, of course, eventually, or limiting eventually, and that is containment, the emerging countries, particularly China, for the access to those natural resources outside its boundaries, but which is a, a strategy of containment with a view to rolling back in the future, just similar to the strategy which uh, developed for 70 years vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union of, the, of, the, of that time. Um, uh, but also depriving all the others, which count for zero, from the access to those natural resources. From the logic of this generalized monopoly capital, Africa is important because it has resources, but Africans are rather an obstacle than anything else. And that can be said, etc., etc., including in the emerging countries. And I will take to the, come to this point with respect to India. You have simultaneously emerging India and lumpen development of India for the majority. And the two associated, the two associated cannot be dissociated. Now, that, that is their strategy. It, has, it is a strategy which implies the military control of the planet. And that was developed by, uh, uh, what was, uh, uh, was formulated by Clinton, not by Bush, could not formulate anything. By Clinton, uh, before Bush, in the project of the 21st American century. American century is not correct. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, the uh, collective imperialism of the triad with not a hegemony, but with a leadership of the US for the 21st century. That needs the military control of the planet. And the military control of the planet means able to contain containment and eventually uh, later or, or earlier through a uh, preemptive war, and that was written in the reports signed by Clinton against China and perhaps also Russia. And uh, India, if the Indians are naughty, but they are not, not naughty for the time being. Uh, I mean the state, huh? <laughs> the ruling class, uh, etc. That is a strategy of war. And it is that strategy of war which is, in my opinion, the explanation of the choice uh, by the collective imperialism of the triad and by its leader, the United States, the first strike on the Middle East countries. In order to, not only to control directly oil, which is not any, unimportant, uh, but also uh, to, uh, uh, to be, uh, Baghdad is at equal distance from London, Johannesburg, Beijing, and Singapore, huh? to control our uh, old world, as we say. Huh? Um, and, 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 and therefore prepare further step. That uh, in, implied the destruction of the societies of the region, the destruction of the societies of the region. Uh, and this, I don't want to go, I have started at six and five, huh? so I should until uh, ten to, 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 to seven. Fine. Okay. <laughs> I have a watch.
and not an Egyptian one. <laughs> Japanese. Uh, a Japanese, Japanese. <laughs> uh, uh, that is the strategy. It's, it is a strategy of war and destruction of countries. If I had time, I would say the model is Iraq. That is uh, destroying a country by replacing a dictatorship, but um, <coughs> one which was what it was, by three uglier dictatorships in the name of religion and ethnicity, and by uh, a systematic assassination of all the uh, intelligentsia of the, of the country, uh, from uh, engineers, scientists, uh, including poets, and so on, systematically. Eh? Well, you know what is being said about Katyn and the Russians and Soviet in Katyn. Well, two presidents of, of uh, United States have assassinated much more uh, uh, Iraqis than were assassinated in Katyn, and no, nobody says anything. Hmm? about their crimes. So that is the pattern. Now, that pattern includes, therefore, through this military control, lumpen development, uh, which means that um, it is a, a, a kind of, uh, call it development if you wish, uh, of, of economic uh, uh, reproduction uh, in which the survival activities grow uh, uh, more than any other pattern of, uh, of new, modern, productive activities. Survival economy. And this is at the root of the uh, rhetoric and blah blah and policies of uh, reducing poverty, a good governance, uh, 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 fight corruption, all those which are nothing else but management of pauperization. Management of pauperization in order to make it politically accepted, not acceptable, but politically accepted. And this is what I think this system is, uh, is uh, not, not sustainable. It's not only not sustainable for ecological reasons, this is actual and real, but it is also politically, not only morally, but politically not sustainable, and the proof of it is that uh, <coughs> There is those movements of resistance, explosion, appraisals, uh, er everywhere. It will come everywhere, etc., etc. That means that we have reached a point where a uh, uh, really existing capitalist imperialist system, at that point in its history, is an obsolete system, which has nothing to offer but, uh, but uh, apartheid on a global scale, uh, destruction of uh, the small minority that we represent, the Asians, the Africans, and the Latin Americans, 85% of humankind. Hmm? Our destruction, nothing else. Now, that lumpen development, whether associated with emerging or not emerging, that lumpen development has indeed changed completely, and I come to the last part of what is the alternative to that, has changed completely the map of, let's say, class uh, uh, construction, class uh, uh, structures. Hmm? That is that we have now a wider proletariat than we had any, at any point in time before, because before we had working people, working classes, but in different modes of productions, which were interlinked and submitted to the domination of capital, but some of them could be called our own language, pre-capitalist, whatever you call them, feudal or not, etc., etc., a petty production, but relatively autonomous, all interlinked, with a certain pattern of distribution of classes uh, accordingly. Now we have a, a very different pattern of the distribution of classes, in which we have a wider proletariat, but with more segmentation and fragmentation. That is, um, uh, taking the... Uh, um, um, form of a, a, a big variety of integration in the sub, all submitted productive systems, including the informal, they are not marginal, marginal or out of the system, they are completely integrated in that. It is part of the spiral down of surviving uh, um, <coughs> lumpen development, surviving activities, uh, uh, inflating and developing at 
uh, higher rates in uh, employment of people, if one can say, etc., etc. And now we are facing that. That is, we have to conceive, but that creates for us a gigantic opportunity, um, which is that there is the objective ground if we, if the radical left take it properly, and I have no blueprint to say you should do this and that because it's different from one country to another, for sure, but it has something in common. We have the objective ground for building an alternative historical block, say, to use uh, Gramsci's uh, language, a, an alternative historical block, I would call it anti-comprador, the new comprador, that is the uh, my small minority, but which is benefiting from the increasing inequalities, in, which includes some segments of the middle class, not necessarily the whole middle class, depending on time, and, and perhaps it included uh, a good part of the middle class uh, some time ago in India, but now that they are attacked hmm, by capital less and less. So a, a, a broad alliance, uh, and this is the challenge. This challenge should lead to, if we, if we uh, meet the challenge correctly, and uh, as I said, no blueprint, but this is a challenge for the radical left. Because one of the two things that is we facing that those, um, this um, um, challenge, we have two alternatives or two choices. choices. One is to adjust to the system, respond day after day to the immediate challenges of the system. That is leaving the initiative in the hands of uh, mon generalized monopoly capital and its local comprador servants and allies. Uh, and, uh, and I think moving from defeat to defeat, even if the movement of resistance grows. Hmm? Uh, no victories, uh, adjusting. And this can be uh, given some apparent legitimacy by saying, well, the crisis is so hard that we ought, and oh, capitalism has uh, um, hard skin. We cannot get rid of it. Um, and therefore, um, moving out or trying to move out of the crisis of capitalism, ending the crisis of capitalism, helping capitalism to end its own crisis, I think this would lead nowhere but to defeat. Nowhere. But this is a challenge for the, for the, for the, for the uh, uh, radical left, for, for us, for the communists all over the world. Huh? And I feel it in Egypt as well as it could be felt, I think, in any other place, uh, including India. The other, uh, other alternative is to understand that this system, which has reached the stage of becoming objectively obsolete, capitalism, uh, this uh, crisis might be its autumn, the autumn of this system. Now, how to uh, 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 have this autumn of the system coinciding with the spring of the peoples, not only the Arabs, huh? but all. Hmm? Uh, that is of, and this is the other alternative, not ending the crisis of participating to trying to end helping capital to move out of its crisis with no, with no success, because this crisis is due to the internal contradictions of that system and not to our uh, attack on it. And therefore, those internal contradictions will deepen the crisis, will continue to deepen the crisis, whatever they do and whatever we would do to help them to do it. And it will always be wrong and always be um, um, uh, deceitful from our point of view. The alternative being we move to the offensive. That is, we move to, uh, that is the historical opportunity to uh, start moving out of capitalism in crisis, of capitalism imperialism, by developing, and this is where I say, independent initiative. Now, and I, 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 I conclude on that, independent initiative. We had a parallel, but a parallel is always dangerous to stress too much on it. 
And after World War II, uh, uh, non alignment uh, 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 Bandung and non alignment did not came out of the uh, of the head of Nehru, uh, uh, Nasser, and other. It came out of us, the communists. We started imagining a strategy of offensive, and that led with all the water put in the wine, of course, to Bandung and to non-alignment, etc., etc. Now, we have to, uh, in other conditions, to move to such independent uh, initiatives. Independent of initiative of whom? Of the peoples, of the nations, and of the states. I go back to Mao on that. Huh? The three levels of reality. Of the peoples, meaning the popular classes. And I would call them the new vast proletariat with its uh, uh, segmentation. Hmm? Without starting there, nothing else will change. It will not come from convincing the governments or the wishful thinking people uh, to, to change. Or through a so-called consensus, we are all in the same boat, and there is a menace on the earth, and therefore, etc. the naive uh, ecological uh, vision. The naive, because the ecological uh, question is, is real. Is, but uh, it will not come. So it has to start there. And this is the challenge for the radical left. S associated to it is the national question. Call it as you want. Eh? That is the uh, so-called cultural, I don't know what. I would call them political culture, not culture. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, stressing on uh, lang language, religion, I, I don't know what, but on the political culture of the people who, uh, that is um, uh, uh, fighting for a really pluricentric, not hegemony. You know, the Chinese word hegemony is replacing imperialism because it's no more fashionable to say imperialism. Uh, a pluricentric globalization. That is a globalization which allows for a room of maneuver for the ruling classes and the states, but also for the popular classes within those states which have a wider room of maneuver. And this is where we should be radical, but not leftist in the bad words meaning of the word. That is, do not, uh, uh, do not, um, uh, um, um, value down the, uh, the capacity of states to change. We had the example of Latin America, which has only initiated some changes, precisely because there were stronger movements earlier than we have, which took some initiatives, which brought uh, some uh, changes, positive but limited, and so on. So I stop at that point, because it is time for discussion. Um, I'm uh, afraid that I did not give an answer to the question raised. Uh, uh, what is uh, to be done with labor today? But I think that is part uh, of the uh, overall picture. Thank you.